All right, I think we are live with everybody here. In case all of you guys are wondering why the strange background in the mat, um, I am actually at a wrestling tournament for my daughters. And uh, this is the World um, Wrestling in Reno, Nevada. So we came out here. I wanted to make sure that I get a chance to spend it with you guys as well. So that's why we wanted to make sure that we still have this live. So I'm in the hotel room. My girls, they finished their matches and uh, they're both doing great. It's it's just, it's such a blessing to be able to be there and watch them fight. Now I can tell you, <clears throat> my younger one is seven. My older one is 11. And when they were at this age as they are now and doing the stuff they're doing, it's incredible. When I was that young, it's crazy. I wasn't doing any of this. Now I was in Pakistan, that's where I was born. I stayed there till I was 10 years old. I came to the States, but even then, just to watch them do all the amazing stuff and have so much heart. I, I tell you, in our lifetimes, you know, there's this uh, beautiful song I talked about last week, which was, you know, what you leave behind. And all we ever leave behind is our legacy. And the legacy is, is if you have the chance to raise kids and you just have that chance to watch a brand new life blossom, whether it's your kids or you're a teacher or you're a, a tutor or a mentor or a martial arts instructor, the chance to influence a life, that is like the greatest legacy that you leave behind. So for those of you guys who are blessed to have any of those opportunities, it's truly the greatest thing. So with that, today is all about AMA, which is ask me anything you wanna know about, whether it's health, nutrition, kidneys, longevity, uh, weight loss, name it. My job is to answer as best as I can with the evidence. So once again, not to give you guys my opinion, but to always share the evidence with you. So let's see, David asked the first question. And uh, if you got questions, pop them in the chat. Oh, did somebody say there is no audio there? So for those of you guys who can hear, can you hear me? So if anybody can put in the chat to make sure you guys can hear me okay, and uh, hopefully you guys can see me okay as well. So with that, uh, awesome, audio is good. We hear beautiful. So let's uh, go into the comments. The first question was from David was turmeric. You know, turmeric is interesting because there's a lot of anti-inflammatory benefits. But if you're going to use turmeric, the best way to do it is to do the root itself, cook with it, use it in other things. When you take it in the form of a capsule, the challenge that you have is a lot of turmeric has been linked to having contaminants. What kind of contaminants? Things like heavy metals. And those are the things that become very, very concerning and you really want to be mindful of. So it's the heavy metals that we get worried about. It. There's also the question of having higher concentrations of oxalate. And we've talked about this in the past around the turmeric video. So the answer to that is it does have oxalates, but you're going to end up getting oxalates from a lot of other sources anyways. Remember the thing with oxalates in your diet, this is completely counterintuitive. So remember this key point. The key point is if you're going to take in oxalates and you take in a diet that is rich in calcium, what's going to happen is that calcium is going to bind to the oxalate inside your gut. It's going to prevent the oxalate from getting absorbed. And therefore, you end up, when you go to the restroom, you'll end up pooping it out. So the idea there with oxalates is is a diet rich in calcium, not calcium supplements, but a diet rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, etc., will help to bind to the oxalate and prevent it from going under. Um, Van asked the question, why are fried foods bad on the kidneys? So Van, this is, it's a little tricky, right? Because it's not so much that fried foods are specifically bad directly on the kidneys, it's that what do fried foods translate into? So for example, if you're having fried foods, as you know, you're getting oftentimes the worst of all three of the big criteria. So if you take French fries and you fry them, you get salt, sugar, and fat. So people add salt to their French fries, so you're getting the salt there, you're getting the sugar in the form of simple carbohydrates, and you're getting the oil with it. All three of those things, what we know is will lead to insulin resistance, will lead to weight gain in the long run. And as a result, excess weight will put pressure on the kidneys. You 
you can have things like secondary FSGS, a secondary FSGS or focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. That's a mouthful of saying you have all this pressure that's being added on top of the kidneys and over time that's going to lead to scarring. The other thing is, is fried foods where the data shows is that it can start to affect the gut microbiome or the bacteria in your gut. The more you change the bacteria in your gut to unhealthy bacteria, the more you create situations where you can have issues of leaky gut. In other words, sometimes when I see patients, what I'll tell them is, is if, you know, they weigh more and another person weighs less and both people eat a sandwich with 100 calories. They may absorb 90 of those calories versus the person who weighs less may only absorb 70. And the reason is the gut bacteria. This is why in studies, when they take lean mice and they take the fecal material from lean mice, they put it into obese mice. What happens to the obese mice? They lose weight and get leaner. Vice versa, they take the fecal material from obese mice, they put it inside lean mice. What happens to the lean mice? They gain weight. This is not changing their chow. Obviously, this is not changing their living environment. All they're literally changing is the fecal material, and that is the bacteria. So changing the bacteria in your gut is a very big deal. So when you talk about this concept of fried foods, it's inflammation, it's the damage that's happening to the bacteria in the gut. It's the idea that it's going to lead to excess calories, which can cause more weight. There's the notion of damage at the cellular level from fried oils and so forth that can occur. Those are all indirect ways that it can affect the kidneys. Um, Casey Franco said, hello and thanks. I'm concerned about high albumin, creatinine, and high protein creatinine ratio." You mentioned biopsy can help determine the cause, but how do I suggest this? My doctor hasn't said anything about it. So Casey, the, the first thing about protein to creatinine is when we're looking at that ratio, ideally we're trying to get it less than one. So the goal is to spill less than one gram. Now that's not normal. That's just the treatment target. What we consider to be a success in studies is if we either get your protein all the way down to normal range, or we improve it by 50%, that's considered a success. So if your protein in the urine is high, and remember normal is 200, so if it's higher than that, then what we want to look at is the basics. We never go to a biopsy first. So if somehow you thought you need a biopsy, what you want to talk to your doctor about is, I have this protein in the urine, what is the next steps I should be doing. So they'll talk about the basics. First, it's blood pressure control. It's weight control. Those are going to be very important. Of course, it's sugar control. The use of medications like ACE inhibitor or angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. Those are medications that end in pril, lysinopril, banazapril, enalapril. Other types of medications are the ARTENs or ARB. So Losartan, Valsartan are examples. We also use medications that are called SGLT2 inhibitors or sodium glucose transport inhibitors. And SGLT2s can be very effective in lowering the protein in the urine. So if you have a patient that has protein they're spilling in the urine, they come and see me. If I use these medications, and I don't see that their creatinine is getting worse, that their creatinine is okay. And what I'm using is, is these medications to control the protein in the urine, and the protein in the urine goes down. Then there's no reason why you should go for a biopsy. Because remember, inherently, you're sticking a needle into one of the most vascular parts of your body, your kidneys. They get so much blood flow, they get 20% of your blood supply going to them. So such a vascular organ, the last thing you want to do is stick a kidney if you didn't need to. And if, God forbid, there's any bleeding, it would be really, really difficult. So that's the explanation to that. All right, let's go to the next question. And Casey asked the next question, which was, how do we plan for a preemptive transplant? Seems like it's all about timing and seems tricky to pull off. So Casey, it's 
it's not so much about timing. What happens is, is first, the supply of kidneys out there is limited. And what we end up doing is, is we try to make sure that the right people go on the list. So in other words, we want the GFR or kidney function to be less than 20. And having it less than 20 actually becomes really important because of the fact that when you're at that point, that's the ideal time to work on getting you on the transplant list. That's the place where if you got called and you got the kidney, that's your GFR 15 or whatever, you got the call, you got the kidney, it makes sense. Because depending on where you live, the wait for transplant is so long. It's somewhere between two years, some places it's 10 years. I'm in California. The wait times are quite large in California. Uh, if you watched some of the previous episodes, I talked about the fact that we just had the very first pig transplant into a human. And just so you know, the update on that is, is the gentleman who got the transplant. He's been discharged. He's going home. As I hear more about this, I will bring it up to you guys. And by the way, if you guys hear any updates on the pig transplant, please let me know as well. And I know that from an animal rights perspective, we want to find a more ethical way to do this. We want to find a way that does not involve animals, 100%. Right now, there are so many people that are suffering and dying on the transplant list. And the question is, can we do something to help them in their cause? So as far as Casey, the overall question goes, it's really about not doing it too early because you, your normal or natural kidneys are the best thing you're ever going to have. So just remember that the last thing you want to do is end up being early in the transplant. You want to do it at the right time where the transplanted kidney is really needed because immunosuppression is a big deal. You're shutting down or lowering your own immune system. So you can't fight off infections as well. You can't fight off cancer cells. So there's a risk of getting cancer. So this is why you want to do everything you can to preserve your kidneys. And if, God forbid, you do need a transplant, you want to work with a transplant nephrologist so that we can get you on the list at the right time. Uh, let's see. Paula Brown. Hi, Paula. Paula said, I had a 24-hour urine collection done by my nephrologist. I did the test correctly and was a 59. I'm assuming your GFR was a 59. This is supposed to be the gold standard, which is more accurate than an eGFR, correct? So your eGFR was 68. Your GFR on the test was 59. But here's the thing. Is it the gold standard, Paula? The answer is not necessarily. Look, when you do a 24-hour urine test, you're also relying on the fact that you're going to be doing the same things you normally do. For example, what if you didn't do the full 24 hours? What if you did longer than 24 hours? Or what if you did shorter than 24 hours? So maybe what's happening there is, is that during those 24 hours, you actually didn't drink enough water. So your concentration of creatinine is looking like it's more than it is usual. So just because we talk about 24-hour urine collections as a standard and as the gold standard, there are still so many things that can throw it off. What I do with my patients is I look for trends. So an individual number is not as meaningful as a trend. For example, if you have a GFR of, let's say, 20. Now, Paula, your GFR is either 59 or 68. Let's say your GFR is 20 and you stay at 20 for decades. Does that mean that all of a sudden I'm going to say, oh, my God, you're going to die? No, it actually means that you're stable, you're doing great. And if we keep you there, we've accomplished our goal. So don't let a test dictate it. Look at the trend. And so if you're going to use the eGFR, which I do with most of my patients, I continue to use it and I look for trends. And I ask them to do the test usually at the same time, first thing in the morning. That's where I can get the best, more accurate readings. And even though creatinine, when you measure it, it's the idea behind that is, is it's based on a concentration. So the challenge you always have is you can alter the concentration pretty easily. But when you get several values over time and you average them out, it gives you trends. And in kidneys, it's all about trends more than one single value. Okay, let's go to um, 
Tyler. So Tyler said, um, urine uh, albumin creatinine ratio is 386 to 78 milligrams over the last four months with Losartan. Tyler, that's incredible. Wow, great job there. Uh, blood work is good, not obese, not diabetic. GFR looks good in the last four months. Wow, beautiful blood pressure. Better to stay on uh, Losartan, increase it, or SGLT2? Excellent question, Tyler. So what Tyler is asking is, he's doing great. His blood pressure is good. The protein in the urine has been minimized. Does he need to add another agent or to replace his current agent with a different agent? And the answer to that question, Tyler, is no. You do not need to. Remember, Losartan is actually a very safe drug overall. Um, the side effects on it are very, very minimal. SGLT2s, even though I love, I absolutely love SGLT2s, but there's problems with them. For example, they're going to make you pee out sugar. There's a higher risk of urine tract infection. There can even be not just bacterial, but fungal infections down there. There's a risk for what we call ketoacidosis or ketone bodies in overabundance building up in the blood that can also be life-threatening. And so that's where. And guys, if you're hearing stuff in the background, it's my kids who are just uh, back. They're trying to eat some food and, and I'll, I'll see if they want to come on camera so I can introduce them in a second too. I don't think you guys have ever had the chance to meet him, but I think it'll be really cool for you guys to get a chance to meet them. Um, all right, so let's go to the next one. Helena asked the question, if a graft can work on your leg. So Helena, when you're talking about a graft, I, I want to make sure what graft you're referring to. So for example, when we talk about grafts for dialysis, we can do grafts on the thighs, absolutely, and those work great. So remember in dialysis, and I'm assuming you're talking about fistula versus graft, but in dialysis, you have five locations on your body. You have your arms and you have your two legs, that's four. And then you have the stomach type of peritoneal dialysis, that's five. In the arms, you can take an artery and a vein connected and when you connect it that's called a fistula and if that doesn't work then you can use a graft which can be composed of different types of material like ptfe and it will connect the artery to the vein and when you do dialysis you would be using the needles into the graft material to be able to get that done okay so that's the the thing about grafts is if you need it and the leg is the only place that they can do it. Absolutely. We have so many patients that do it. Um, Casey said, you've mentioned a sweet spot for sodium bicarbonate. What does that mean? So Casey, it's, it's not so much in the particular example that we may have been referring to is the idea that really you want that bicarb to be above 22. If your bicarb is really high, what it may be a sign of is that maybe in your lungs, there's more acid. So your body's trying to hold on to bicarb to balance out your pH. So what I mean by sweet spot is trying to be in that middle of the range. And really most of the data points to being above 22 on the bicarb level. And nature's bicarb is fruits, vegetables, right? It's a plant-based diet. And we always come back to this where the data has finally ca caught up with what I've been talking about for what almost seems like 15 to 20 years now of asking people to go on a plant-based diet. So there you go. Um, what is the usual cause of swelling in the kidneys? And should you worry about high vitamin B12 levels? So in terms of the cause of swelling in the kidneys, you know, that's tricky because unfortunately there isn't a usual cause. There can be so many things that can cause there to be swelling in the kidneys. Now, Sometimes you're talking about specifically swelling. Sometimes you're talking about kidney enlargement. And if you're talking about kidney enlargement, there's a number of diseases. There's cancers like myeloma. There's diabetes that can do it. And so there's so many different things that can cause your kidneys to actually grow larger. And we can look at those to figure out what's going on. Sometimes the only way to know is a biopsy. And then um, Mary also asked the question of vitamin B12 levels. What happens if you have high vitamin B12 levels? So remember, B12 levels can cause GI side effects. So you want to be aware that that is one of those things that can happen. And because they are water soluble, just remember, you will be able to get rid of them on your own. So it's not something that you have to do something drastic about. If you just back off, 
you'll see that they'll go away. So that's that. All right, let's see. Donato asked the question of how long does your raised creatinine level last after weight training? I have blood work coming up in seven days. So Donato, when, when you train, it's always a good idea to wait 24 to 48 hours before you go get the blood test done. And if you've taken any creatine supplements or anything else, definitely aim for 48 hours because that actually makes a bigger deal. So as far as that goes, definitely try to see if you could wait one to two days at a minimum to see what's going on. Uh, Carol asked the question, if I take a scoop of protein powder in the morning and nothing else, does that mean I have broken my fast? Wow, that, that's, um, it's a tricky question. If you're talking about fast from the idea of turning down your GI mechanism, trying to get the benefits of the actual fasting, which means that your machine shuts off, and what it does is there's actually a repair and cleansing and preservation mode. And then when you introduce calories back, there's a uh, essentially cleaning of the debris that occurs. So the answer is yes. If you introduce any foods, including uh, protein powder in the morning, that would break it. Now, lots of our patients who do intermittent fasting, even the time-restricted eating version, where you have a fasting window every day, you know, they'll do different variations or versions of it. So if you end up having, for example, when I do it and I have coffee in the morning, it's fine. You just had some coffee, no big deal. So don't think of everything as trying to be a purist. You can certainly do this stuff and be okay with it. All right, let's keep going. Um, let's see, Marva Riley's asked, can lupus be reversed? with diet and lifestyle. So this is tricky, Marva, because it depends on what stages of lupus you have. I know there's a lot of people out there who've said, look, I reversed my lupus by changing my diet. The problem with that statement is, is it depends on how bad your lupus is. If your lupus is causing end-stage organ damage. So let's take lupus nephritis or lupus kidneys. If you have issues that are going on with your kidneys where you're starting to spill protein, Doing a low protein diet will reduce it. Doing anti-inflammatory diet, which is once again a plant-based diet, will reduce the symptoms. But sometimes you have to reduce the immune system and you have to do it early enough in the game that there isn't too much end organ damage. So as you know, I always, always promote lifestyle over everything. It should be the foundation, it should be the middle, and it should be the end. So you want to make sure that you're able to do lifestyle first and always first. And so as far as lifestyle goes, then if you start doing that, you'll never go wrong. But please do not withhold medications or think you need to wait on medications. Because if you do that, that would be a mistake. And that can lead to very dangerous outcomes, including severe end organ damage. You know, lupus can affect every single organ. One of the saddest stories I had was my first encounter with a patient who was very young. She was 20. She showed up into the hospital with a full-blown stroke. And the stroke was how we diagnosed her lupus because it didn't make any sense, an otherwise healthy patient, why she would have a stroke. And if you said lifestyle would help that, that unfortunately, I couldn't agree with that. Now, we still did lifestyle and we did medications. All right. Um, welcome, Barbara. Barbara's from... Uh, New Jersey, and thank you guys for letting me know the audio was okay. As you know, I'm sort of in a hotel, so you never know if the audio is terrible or not. Uh, let's see, more questions. Um, I want to make sure that I don't miss any. Uh, of the two diabetics drugs that also seem to provide kidney protection, do you prefer uh, Jardians or Farshiga? Well, here's the thing. When, when you talk about kidney drugs, don't get too caught up on the idea of brands. Brands aren't going to be as important. And depending on which hospital you work with or so forth going on, you're going to find that each hospital has its own sort of um, drug of choice that they end up using. So, for example, you know, when you talk about Farshiga, which is Dapagliflozin, and when you talk about Jardians, it's Empagliflozin. Now, 
In my institution, we use empagliflozin. That's not to say that, you know, DAPA is bad or anything like that. It just depends on what the contracts are. But you're still getting SGLT2 inhibitor either way. So honestly, use what you can and don't worry too much about the differences. A little bit of everything is usually the best way to get to the end point. All right. Um, what causes swollen kidneys? So we talked about that. And MPM said, I always eat a piece of organic goat or sheep uh, cheese every day as I do enjoy a high oxalate diet. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure I know what to say in terms of that was a question or not, but all right. And let's see, moving along. Next one is, I just lost the questions here. So getting over there in terms of uh, let's see, Uva Ursi. So what are your thoughts about Uva Ursi? I know it's sold over the counter. I don't know enough. So let me make sure that I see if there's any studies or anything like that. I'd be happy to come back and talk to you about it. And then Vidya uh, Sagar Kumar said, humble request to share some more Indian Asian raw fruits for better gut health uh, issues. And so here's the thing. You know, everybody's looking, Vidya, to see if there's anything remarkable or anything magical that's going to cause you better bang for your buck than others. Unfortunately, what the data shows is much more so than trying to look for the miraculous thing, if you focus on variety of fruits and vegetables. You know, when I was going through training, I remember there was this concept of eat the rainbow. And what that meant was just add variety. This way, if you're wrong about something or you're lacking something, you're still trying to focus. Now, you guys know my story. I grew up really, really poor. I grew up in Pakistan and, uh, you know, our stuff was very, very limited. And Vidya, you can appreciate this. I had bindi every single day and that's all we had every single day. So I used to joke with my parents that, you know, it's just, it's a vegetable um, and uh, okra is the other name for it, that I would turn into okra one of these days. Cause literally that's what we had every single day. Cause we were so freaking poor. And so, all those days and all those times, remember, but variety is the spice of life, number one. Number two is there isn't a magical vegetable that's going to make you healthier, but focus on more vegetables, more fruits, and variety. Um, Daydreamer said, hello, doctor. From the recent UC Santa Barbara report on ketogenic intervention, it seems fasting has no effect on slowing the progression of kidney cysts. Is my understanding correct? So the thing about kidney cysts, what we find is sugar feeds cysts. And what a ketogenic diet so, does so well is it eliminates the sugars. Now, other studies that I've talked about on this channel looked at fasting and they saw that fasting also helped to reduce the overall sugar content in the body and that would help the ketogenic process as well. So the answer to that is, is yes, in terms of ketogenic, the ketogenic version of it helps. But in terms of fasting, it is not on the same playing field. But at the same time, there's other studies that show that it can't be negated as far as the effect goes. Uh, Vincent said, wow, sorry, Doc, I almost missed the show. Well, Vincent, we're so glad you decided to come anyways. And let's see, Noel said, hi, Doc, my husband was going to have his fistula and get ready to uh, go on dialysis soon. His GFR is eight but he still doesn't have any symptoms. Just wondering when um, he should start dialysis and what diet he can have. So this is the ultimate question, when to start dialysis. You know, what I've found, and this is my personal experience only, what I've found is that when patients are at that GFR less than 10, what I do is I start them slowly. So we may do slow dialysis once or twice a week to get them started. And the reason we do it that way is because when we start people on three times a week dialysis at the full dose, it is truly life altering for the worst. And so by gradually easing them into it, it makes a difference. Now, sometimes when you wait till the patient has symptoms, it does, <coughs> it does become very, very difficult because it's hard to be able to get them back to their baseline standard. So my personal philosophy, has been when they're less than 10 
and I feel like I'm having some small issues, either electrolytes or volume, I start them on a very gentle cycle. Some of my colleagues wait much longer than that, and others wait earlier. But what I do is I base it on the quality of the person's life. And uh, Noel also asked, he's on a plant-based, low-potassium, low-protein diet right now. So you're doing all the right stuff. You're doing the best you can. And it's hard because the potassium clearance is down. But from that perspective, I do think you're doing everything you could have done. So I, I think you're on the right track. Now, uh, before we continue, guys, I thought I would, I would do something very, very different tonight before I end, which is my daughter's, it's one of those rare lucky things where my daughters are here. So I thought I'd ask my uh, daughters to come on camera for one second and say hi. They're here at the wrestling tournament. So let's see. So this first one is Celine. And Celine, come over here for me, my love. This is my pride and joy. She is how old are you, baby? Seven. She's seven. And she's here. She's fighting in a wrestling tournament. And I just thought I'd share because at the end of the day, once again, we all talk about our legacy. My legacy is right here in terms of what I'm trying to leave behind. And I'm trying to teach her that if you do good for others, it's the greatest thing you can ever do for anybody in this world is share your knowledge, share your joy, and make somebody happy. Faith, come here, love. This is my... Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is my older daughter. This is Faith. And, uh, you know, I, I named them as Faith and Celine, not because it was like Faith, Hill, or Celine Dion, but I named them such because Faith, you know, when we were trying to get pregnant, uh, my wife and I, and we knew it was really hard, we told my daughter, Faith, that, uh, you know, the most important thing you got to know is you got to have the faith. So she is. Um, Okay, go, 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 go back. Yes, go already. She's like a walking, talking miracle. And she was a fighter before she ever started. Um, all right, let me take one more question. And uh, we'll call it at that. Um, okay, uh, vitamin B12, don't take any. No, no, no. Um, vitamin B12, RD, you can absolutely take vitamin B12. There is nothing wrong with taking vitamin B12 if it's too high. Remember, it's water soluble and you will be able to get rid of it. So don't worry about that. Okay, now that I'm all emotional, I'm going to end this um, live stream before I start crying on YouTube. But thank you guys. Have a blessed day. You got to see a piece of my family. And I hope you guys all take care. I'll see you guys next Friday. Thank you.